So good evening, everyone, and welcome at our webinar about the Human Protein Atlas Spatial Proteomics in Health Disease and uh, in Health and Disease by Dr. Cecilia Linsko. So these webinars are organized by the KVCV, the Royal Flemish Chemical Society, of which I'm going to give you now a short introduction. So the KVCV is a chemical society within Flanders, so the Dutch speaking, the northern part of Belgium. And we are a community of chemists in Flanders and far beyond because everyone can become a member of our society. And our members mainly are students, PhD students, academics, teachers, and professionals. So we really do represent and strive to support everyone within the education, the chemical industry, and the society. We mainly organize lectures about popular scientific topics for the general audience or more domain-specific workshops. And afterwards, we typically have a networking reception, but of course, that's not possible in the online editions. Here you have an overview of our upcoming events. If you want more information or for registration, you can always visit our website, kvcv.pe slash calendar. Mens de Molecule is our magazine in Dutch, which is distributed to all our members each month. So we, this means we have 12 editions a year. And in this magazine, you can find news about the chemical industry, about academics, but also about our own activities, scientific advancements, and much more. If you are a member of the KVCV, you are automatically also a member of UCHEMS, European Chemical Society. And as a member of UCHEMS, you have very discount at various activities endorsed or organized by UCHEMS. As a member of KVCV, you also have reduced prices at our activities. Uh, you receive our magazine Men's and Molecular, as already mentioned, but you're also part of the chemistry community within Flanders. And this helps you to extend your knowledge and broaden your network. If you want any more information about our membership, you can always visit our website, kvcv.be slash membership. Our series of webinars is supported by Chemistry Europe and have a look at their journals as they might be of interest for your next publications. So let's stay in touch. You can find, find all our information on our website, kvcv.be, but we can also be reached via our social media channels. We have a Facebook account. We also have a YouTube channel on which you can rewatch all our episodes again. And we also have a LinkedIn page. And now then I will give the word to Martin, who will give you a short introduction about the BEPA. Yes, thank you, Nadam. Um, so welcome, everybody. And uh, first, a big thanks to uh, KVCV for hosting this event. Um, we are BEPA, the Belgian Proteomics uh, Society. Um, and uh, we are here uh, for you. So uh, we are a group of all people working on proteomics in Belgium, and we want to reach out and uh, help people that have questions uh, or are looking for experiments that involve proteins. So make sure to have a look at our website. What you'll be finding there is an overview of these uh, labs that have joined the BEPA. There's probably more, but we already represent uh, quite a few. Um, and there also in the website, we, uh, we always advertise the events that we're organizing. There is um, a job market, uh, if you're looking for a new opportunity. And if you become a member, uh, you're automatically, similar to uh, what KVCV has, uh, you become auto automatically a member of the European Proteomics Association, which uh, has two uh, subdivisions. Uh, of young researchers. The one is the YPIC, the Young Proteomics Investigators Club, which uh, if you're a young researcher, you should surely check out. They help uh, deploy your um, career. So it's not a scientific angle, it's more the career angle of, of, um, um, of things. And UBIC is the European Bioinformatics Community, uh, I think a well-recognized community of highly skilled uh, bioinformaticians. Um, uh, there is a, a close connection to HUPO for those of you that are already in proteomics, where uh, now and then we can uh, offer uh, discounts if you have a membership card. And we can also, uh, we, you actually automatically become a KVCV member if you join BEPA. So uh, we're closely uh, teaming up lately. Just uh, one uh, slide overview of the upcoming event events. 
that might interest you. Uh, on May 28th, I was uh, invited by the Young Proteomics Investigators Club to give a webinar on um, collaboration with industry. And this was in the context of a corona test that uh, we developed recently. Uh, on June 21st, UPA is, uh, is organizing a virtual event for uh, early career researchers in proteomics. Um, and so we as BEPA, we're looking for somebody from Belgium who's willing to give a five minute talk about his or her work. Uh, if you wanna apply and uh, represent BEPA there, please do send us an email. Uh, on July 11th, UPA will be present um, at the European um, Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Disease Conference um, on proteomics in the study of SARS-CoV-2. And that is really a big thing lately, as you can imagine. Um, in September, we're aiming to organize our uh, usually annual um, doctoral schools, where in about four days, we walk you through an entire uh, proteomics workflow with a big emphasis on data analysis and interpretation. And we put it in September because many uh, young uh, researchers can use this to prepare for their interview for a scholarship application. And finally, in December, we'll be having our usually biannual uh, physical meeting. This time, we hope to have it physically. This is the BEPAC for BEPAC conference. It will also be on the spatial proteomics, proteins in space and time. Uh, and the sixth, the first day will be a specifically a pre-conference workshop um, for those of you new to the field. And with that, um, I uh, hand the word to um, Gerben, Secretary of BEPA, who will introduce the speaker of tonight. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, so yes, um, as Martin already mentioned, normally by the end of the year, we should have our first uh, or next physical meeting again. In the meantime, we also try to organize these uh, online events. And today we have a talk lined up by uh, Dr. Cecilia Lindskoch. Currently she's the group lead, she's a group leader in the University of Uppsala. And she has been involved in this initiative, the spatial proteomics and the protein atlas for over 15 years. Correct me if I'm wrong, Cecilia. That was really the early days of that project. So she has been involved in this initiative from the beginning. Currently, she's heading uh, the tissue-based profiling of that initiative of the Human Protein Atlas, where she has a main emphasis on immunohistochemistry, antibody validation, and cell type specific localization in human and normal and cancer tissues. I'm really looking forward to this uh, talk by Dr. Cecilia Linskog. Um, maybe before we start off and I give the word to Dr. Cecilia Linskog, maybe a, a small practical announcement. If you have questions throughout the talk, there is a Q&A button uh, somewhere below in your Zoom uh, representation and that can be used to ask questions. Uh, so by all means, do not use the chat box to raise questions, but uh, use the Q&A box to uh, ask your questions. And then by the end of the talk, we will try to cover most of these questions. With this, uh, I'll gladly introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Cecilia Linskog. Uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. And I would first like to thank uh, KVCV and the Belgium Proteomics Association for inviting me to this talk. And of course, all the attendants for being interested in listening. I'll share my screen. So I will give you an overview of the Human Protein Atlas project. And I hope that both of you that have heard of the project several times before and those that are completely new to this topic will learn something new because there are many new updates within the last year as well. So the Human Protein Atlas project started in 2003 as a Swedish effort, mainly built on transcriptomics and antibody-based proteomics. And the overall aim is that we want to map all the human building blocks, so all the human proteins at different levels, both in cells, organelles, tissues, and organs. And 
with this, we built an open access knowledge database, proganatlas.org, that is open access and publicly available with more than 100,000 visitors per month. And this has been growing over the years. And the last version that we published in November last year, which we called version 20, targets more than 17,000 proteins with at least one antibody. And the next version is planned for October this year. And as you know, there are many big efforts in the world that generate big data, different levels. But the challenge is what to then do with all this data and make knowledge out of it and how this in the end can somehow be useful for the clinic and lead to something that can benefit the patients. So what we want to do and having this in mind is to think of how we can make the data into knowledge that we generate as part of the Human Protein Atlas project. And as part of the release in November last year, we also celebrated that it was 20 years since the Human Protein Atlas was initiated as a pilot project focusing on one particular chromosome. And here we then also launched a new section of the Human Protein Atlas where you can read what happened throughout the entire project, all the major milestones that we did and learn about the different methods. And here you can also find many key references to many of the publications, both from us and collaborators and other proteomics researchers in the world. So I really recommend you to go into this section and there is also a PDF booklet that we did together with science where all our key publications from science are included as well. And if you want to hear more than we, then I will present here today. There is also a launch webinar with some more details of some of the sections I'm presenting here. And as part of this 20 year celebration, we also launched a microsite at the certain other website where we comprehensively describe the major milestones that we have uh, achieved during these 20 years. And we have also generated educational videos that I will recommend you to look into. They're very, very beautiful. So these are images, uh, videos in 3D using light sheet microscopy. What we want to do with the Human Protein Atlas and all the data that we have generated there is to make this comprehensively summarized so that it can be easy to find information about proteins at different levels, both in the human body and in cell lines and in blood. And we have therefore divided all the data into six main sections. And I will present all of these sections um, in my presentation today. So in the tissue atlas, uh, which is the group I'm mainly working in myself, we want to study all the human proteins using immunohistochemistry on tissue microarrays. And by using tissues, we will be able to look at the expression of proteins using spatial proteomics. So we can look inside single cells and see what these proteins are found. And we also combine this with quantitative data at the transcriptomic level. Apparently we have a coverage of almost 80% of the human genes with at least one antibody. We use data for 44 tissues that cover uh, most of the organs in the human body. But we not only want to generate the data, but we spend a lot of effort validating the information. And we do that by both trying to determine if we think that the antibody binds to the correct target, which is a very important but also challenging aspect to make sure that the antibody is specific and the staining that we see is not due to unspecific or of target binding. And then we also spend an effort to summarize the data, select representative images and sentences to describe the data. And this is the information that you see when you go into a gene on the human protein atlas. 
by combi combining transcriptomics with antibody-based proteomics, we can gain information both at the mRNA level, which is quantitative, and then compare that with the spatial information at a protein level using immunohistochemistry. The transcriptomics data that we are using in the tissue atlas is based on three different sources, both in-house generated data from ourselves, and we have also used RNA-seq data from the GTEx consortium and RNA data from the front of five consortium in Japan, and then done a normalization of these data sets into something we call a normalized consensus data set which is meant to show a comprehensive overview where all the genes are expressed throughout the human body and you can compare levels between different organs. And the benefit of using transcriptomics information to compare with the antibody-based proteomics is that we can divide the genes into different groups of genes depending on tissue specificity. So we have defined certain RNA categories, for example, genes that are tissue enriched, where we see that one tissue is expressed at at least awful higher level uh, compared to in all of the other tissues. And here we hope uh, that we identify most of the genes and proteins that have organ specific functions because they're much higher expressed in just one organ compared to all of the other ones. But there are also genes that are expressed in a group of tissues, and these could often be tissues that have something in common, but sometimes you also see very interesting combinations uh, that could be uh, very interesting targets to study further and try to understand their function. And then there are, of course, genes and proteins that are expressed in the entire human body that are needed for all cells to function. And here you find, for example, mitochondrial proteins and ribosomal proteins and so on, and a small fraction that is not detected in any of the tissue types. And it's relatively few that end up in this group. Um, and it could be due to different reasons. Maybe that we haven't looked at the correct tissues or they're just expressed under certain functional circumstances or under fetal development or something. But this is really helpful to divide the genes into different groups that we then can compare with using immunistic chemistry. So when we then do the immunistic chemical staining, we will see the protein expression in the context of neighboring cells and the cell type specificity. And especially when looking at unknown proteins, this gives important information about the potential function of the protein if you know exactly in which cell type you can find the information, and also that it is an impact issues. So if you click on a gene on the human protein atlas, you will see in the tissue atlas an overview of the protein expression levels based on the intensity of the brown staining that is low, medium, or high. And you can then also see the mRNA expression based on three different data sets and the merged consensus mRNA data set has a unit of NX, normalized expression. And if you click on any of these bars, you will then get into the actual images. And normally we have stained three individuals per tissue type, and sometimes more than one antibody. You will see them next to each other. And by clicking on them, you will get into the virtual microscope and can zoom in where you will see the exact scoring, how we manually evaluated the staining in the main cell types that can be found in this tissue and also the tissue information, age and gender and so on. And there are also knowledge chapters where you can learn more about different organs and especially these lists of genes that are elevated in a certain organ compared to all the other ones. So these lists are then clickable and lead into specific protein stainings. And you can also learn more about the organ function. So these are sort of like Wikipedia pages. And I really recommend you to go into these to learn more. And of course, there are very many images. And 
even though we have tried to summarize a lot of the data as scoring and try to highlight the most important findings, I really recommend everyone to go into the images and have a look yourself as well because not everything can be retrieved from the data. And maybe you can find many new interesting things by just looking at the images yourself as well. But as I mentioned, we spend a lot of effort on antibody validation, which is really important. And this has been lifted by the scientific community in many different ways uh, throughout the last couple of years, and especially because it has shown that there are many antibody studies that are not reproducible. So there was an international working group formed called IVGAV, International Working Group for Antibody Validation, that met for a year and tried to come up with suggestions how antibodies should be validated. And this was an international consortium involving researchers from the entire world and they also had discussions with antibody providers and journals, and discussions are still ongoing, uh, but a lot has happened throughout these last years, which I think is great that many journals are now demanding that the antibodies need to be properly validated when findings are presented in scientific papers. So this working group suggested five different pillars for validation to be used, and also lifted that the validation has to be performed in a context-specific manner. And that's really important as well. So even if an antibody is working for Western blot, that does not necessarily say that it is specific for immunistic chemistry. So you still need to validate it in the application that you will be using it. And we have implemented these pillars in the Human Protein Atlas, and currently there are 10,000 antibodies that are validated by at least one of the pillars. But we will come to a little bit of challenge for immunistic chemistry and tissues because you cannot knock down the gene, of course, in a biobank human tissue. And you cannot use all of these methods. So when it comes to immunistic chemistry, there are just two of these pillars that can be implemented. One is independent antibody strategies, where you would use an independent antibody that binds towards a non-overlapping sequence of the same protein. And ideally, they would then show a similar staining pattern to confirm each other. But the challenge here is that they could bind to specific different uh, isoforms, or one could be directed towards the intracellular part, and the other one could be extracellular. So there could, of course, be explanations that they aren't similar. And the other one is orthogonal strategies, where you would compare the staining pattern with an antibody independent method. And here we have implemented a comparison with mRNA levels. Um, but of course, there is not to a 100% a perfect correlation between mRNA and protein. And there could be explanations for that, of course, with post translational modifications and secreted proteins that are translated somewhere and then found somewhere else in the body. But we do think this is a really good guidance. And we, for most of the proteins, where we know where they're supposed to be expressed based on literature, we also see a really good correlation. So we use this as a best estimate for determining where to set the threshold for unspecific binding and trying to determine if the staining is specific. And here I would like to show you one example. Um, that also involves SARS-CoV-2 related research, where we decided to do a study looking at ACE2, the suggested receptor for the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus, because there was just one study published many, many years ago that did not cover all of the human tissues. And it was not clear how this antibody had been validated. So we thought there was 
a need to complement this study with a more detailed overall overview of the protein expression throughout the whole human body. And we started them by looking at the mRNA expression levels based on the three transcriptomics data sets that we have. And it was quite clear that ACE2 is highly expressed in intestine, kidney, testes, gallbladder, and heart. But when you then come down to lower levels, based on bulk RNA sequencing, it's quite tricky to draw a conclusion what to expect. Uh, so this is at transcriptomics level, but it's three different data sets that are merged. These are mean values. So it could, when it's low expression, it could mean that some individuals have higher levels, others have lower. We looked at little, a little bit at that, but we didn't see that much difference between individuals actually. But still, we have a detection cutoff. And if something is just above or just below, it's, it's of course very hard to use this orthogonal validation by only looking at it at this. And what's quite interesting here is that lung is actually below cutoff and you would expect that ACE2 is highly expressed in lung. So this we were of course interested in looking into further also at the protein level. Uh, but first, we also looked into single cell RNA sequencing data sets that were publicly available. And these largely reflected the bulk transcriptomics data with intestine, kidney, testes, and much lower expression in the human airways, at least when looking at uh, thresholds uh, of a high proportion of um, expressed cells. But when we zoomed in a little bit more and set a threshold if that in this figure, just 1% of the cells could show expression, we did see that certain cell types came up and especially in lung that in three different data sets, there was higher expression in type two alveolars, alveolar cells, but still just in 1% of the cells. So this is of course very interesting. And and a little bit inconsistent data between data sets and uh, upper airway epithelia, if it's in goblet cells or maybe in ciliated cells, it's not completely clear. And it's, it differs a little bit between data sets as well. So we then collected tissue samples from the entire human body and used two different antibodies that we had tested previously. I wanted to do a very high, um, confident investigation to look at as many cell types as possible in these tissues. And the end result was that it largely confirmed the bulk RNA sequencing data. We could find high expression in the intestine, testes, gallbladder, and so on. But what was very interesting and shows the utility of spatial proteomics is that you can see expression in small subsets. You can see that it's just in cilia and sometimes membrane under cilia, um, in small blood vessels and details that you cannot really determine from the mRNA and also not the single cell RNA sec data. And uh, that really shows the strength of spatial proteomics. And then one must remember that not all findings are translated between transcriptomics and proteomics either. And when we then looked into the airways, uh, we were able to find expression in ciliated cells of both nasal mucosa and bronchus. And we stained a cohort of almost 360 lung individuals of normal lung, where we finally could find expression in two individuals for one of the antibody and one individual for the other one in some rare cells that we think are the, sorry, type two plemocytes. So we, we had to look for these, but it did confirm the single cell Arnisic data set. But um, this is, of course, then interesting to think of further what this means for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. But 
we do think that we have thoroughly validated where ACE2 is expressed throughout the human body and the expression in lung is, is quite low. And this was then also confirmed with Western blot and check this in publicly available mass spectrometry data sets. So this is an example how you can consider validation of antibodies and align that with other methods to try to determine if the protein staining that you see is specific. And if we didn't have any other type of data to compare with, it would not be possible to know how you would dilute the antibody. And if you would dilute it wrong, it could also be possible to get brown staining throughout the entire human body. You need positive and negative controls to know where to set the threshold somehow. The most recent addition to the human protein atlas is the single cell type atlas. And there we have used publicly available single cell RNA-seq data from 13 different human tissues and blood. And this we have then integrated with the antibody-based profiling in the tissue atlas so that we can provide a high resolution single cell type map of human tissues. And here we have done a normalization of the protein coding transcript chameleon across all genes. So for each cell cluster, we have uh, done an average and normalized that so that we can get absolute values for each cell cluster. And we then use this to do a classification in the similar way as we did for the tissue atlas. So instead of a gene being tissue enriched, for example, in testes, we could then instead say that it's cell type enriched, for example, in spermatids or some other cell type in testes. So this got, gives much higher level of information and would then be even easier to compare with the tissue-based immunistic chemistry data at the cell type level. And it also confirmed the tissues where we did find the highest number of elevated genes, which was consistent with the bulk transcriptomics data as well. And the way you can use this is that if you get into the tab called cell type, you will get a bar chart of all the cell types that we have looked at, 53 main cell types throughout the entire human body. And you can then also click on a certain a cluster or a certain tissue and get into the UMAP plots that are interactive so that you can see the expression in each cell type as well, and then toggle between the tissue atlas images to look at the expression in tissues and see how that compares with the cell type specificity based on single cell rna -seq. So some future efforts that we're working on in combination of the tissue and cell type atlas is that we're adding more details to the existing images. We're doing that by doing in-depth analysis. So we involve different experts to look at the images that we already have and see if they can find more cell types that we haven't scored previously. And we're also working on projects where we're integrating with the tissue-based um, single cell RNA sec data and used as, as a basis to build cell type specific panels using multiplex imaging. And of course, there are more tissue types than the 44 ones that we have as the standard set. So we're also working on adding novel tissues in cases where we think that the tissues we have are not enough, for example, more regions of brain or hair follicles or more specialized tissues. And one example where we added in-depth scoring was in collaboration with a testis expert, Charles Pinot in France. That's an expert in spermatogenesis that looked at more than 500 proteins that were elevated in testes. And we built an online tool for that so that he could score eight different cell types instead of previously two. And in this way, we can add much more information to the tissue atlas. 
and we then want to continue to do that for more organs and combine that with the single cell RNA sequencing data and build multiplex panels for subsets that we cannot distinguish by the regular immunohistochemistry. And hopefully this will then be an updated version of the tissue atlas in the future. We are working on this currently and have managed to set up a protocol to do this in the regular paraffin embedded tissue material that we have. Then we also have a pathology atlas where we have integrated mRNA data from the TCGA consortium. And we analyze that. And that data also has information on clinical outcome. So how long these patients were alive based on overall survival. So we have used both the transcriptomics data and this outcome data to generate lots of Meyer plots almost a million of them. And in this way, we can then determine which genes that have a significant association with survival that could be associated with prognosis. So by going into the pathology atlas and the 17 cancer types that we have data from, you can see the number of genes that are related to unfavorable prognosis. So high expression of this gene would lead to a poor prognosis and favorable if you have high expression, you would live longer. And for example, clicking on lung cancer, you would get a list of 651 proteins. This is how a list result looks like on the human protein atlas. There are links where you can download the entire list. You can also add your own columns if you want to show more information and then click on a certain hit to get into a gene-specific page where you'll get more detailed information. And for the pathology atlas, we here have an interactive survival scatter plot. So this is actually an example of a highly significant gene that is related to poor prognosis. And it's quite common that data like this is presented as couple of Meyer plots. Um, but if you would plot each individual and seeing if they're alive or dead, you also see that it's, it's quite hard to see the trend here, which also says quite a lot about prognostic markers, that it is a challenge. And even though there are many papers published uh, giving examples of markers that are highly significant in relation to survival, it is, of course, challenging to think what that means to a particular patient somewhere here in the middle that has a certain level of expression and where to, where to set the threshold, how that patient should be treated for their cancer. So this is of course a challenge, um, but hopefully this could be a resource for further discovery that could be uh, further validated by other methods as well. We also show the overall expression across the different cancer types and protein expression data based on immunohistochemistry in a similar way as in the tissue atlas. But these antibody-based stainings are then um, based on tissues collected in Sweden, so they are not from the same individuals as the PCDA data, but still, it gives information about the cell type specific expression and could provide information important to discover potential biomarkers that can be analyzed further. We also have a brain atlas that we released two years ago where we want to highlight genes that are relevant for neuroscience. And we also looked at different species. So we have data from both human, pig, and mouse, and integrated uh, transcriptomics data from different sources, including also inside the hybridization data from the Allen Brain Atlas. And for the most known uh, brain specific genes, we have also looked at the cell type specific localization in, at, in very much in detail 
in more than 100 different mouse brain regions where you can zoom in in an entire mouse brain. And what was quite interesting here was that we actually identified some proteins that differ between the different species um, and many key genes as well. So this could be quite important to have in mind when using animal models to doing we're doing research on the human brain. We also looked at um, expression levels in different regions of the human brain and how that compared to the tissue specificity. And here we could see all types of combinations. So there could be proteins that from a body-wide perspective is found only in brain. But when you then look at in brain, they're found throughout the entire brain. And then also the other way around, that something could be almost ubiquitously expressed throughout the entire human body. But when you look in brain, it might be very specific to just one certain region in brain. So this could also be quite interesting to have a look at, especially when studying proteins for which the function is not known, and then see how that compares to the tissue specificity in the rest of the human body. And in the previous release, we also added more detailed data from the prefrontal cortex with 17 different sub-regions so that you can look at the expression levels even more in detail in these regions. In the blood atlas, we have flow sorted and done RNA sequencing of human blood. I looked at 18 different cell types. We then did a classification of these genes in a similar way as the other atlases so that we can see, for example, which genes are elevated in T cells compared to the other cell types in blood. And we then, found many markers that are known and used in the clinic as cell type specific markers for, for example, T cells, but also found some that are completely unknown. And here it is, of course, interesting to also see how these are staying in human tissues and especially in the immune tissues to search for new potential markers that could be expressed in these cell types. And last but not least, also the cell atlas, where we are looking at expression in different subcellular compartments inside the cells, where we can zoom in very much more in detail to see where the proteins are expressed inside the cells. And we do this with confocal microscopy. So the nucleus is staying with DAPI. In blue, we add microtubules in red, ER in yellow, and then the antibody on top of that in green. And currently, there is a coverage of more than 30 different subcellular organelles. And I just want to highlight that recently, the Human Protein Atlas Associated Researchers published a completely new structure that had not been described before with more than 150 proteins that are expressed in the nuclear oli rim, so a new substructure of the human cell nucleus. And also for the cell atlas, there are knowledge chapters where you can learn more, for example, which cell lines uh, that express different uh, genes. So this could be really helpful when selecting cell lines for different experiments. But especially interesting also the cell cycle dependent proteome. And it has been shown that almost 20% of the human proteome shows some sort of cell to cell variability. We can see this also in tissues, but it becomes even more clear in cell lines that there's a difference in expression between single cells. And some of these are known previously to be related to the cell cycle. But there are also many that show cell-to-cell -cell variability where it's not known that these in some way are related to the cell cycle. 
And especially in cancer, it's known that cell cycle dysregulation can lead to cancer. So it is very important to try to see if there are more genes that could in some way be related to the cell cycle. And a lot of this has previously not been done on the protein level. So in a previous publication, just recently published in Nature by the Cell Atlas group, they identify more than 300 new proteins that were shown to be regulated uh, in be regulating the cell cycle. And it was also shown that the cell to cell variability was larger at the protein level compared to the RNA level. So a lot of the regulation seems to be done um, after translation. And here you can hopefully find many proteins that could potentially be of clinical interest. This data has then also been published and is available on the Human Protein Atlas. The Cell Atlas group has also been involved a lot in many projects relating the society and not solely researchers. And they did a large project as part of a citizen science project where computer game designers wanted to build a mini game for pattern recognition that could be built into an existing computer game. And many such citizen science projects um, related to games previously have more been standalone games where the game was just built around the science, but the new thing here was they wanted to build it into an existing game. And the game they used was EVE Online, which is the largest sci-fi massively multiplayer online game that has a half million players and 40,000 players online at any time. That is, of course, a huge resource and was, of course, a dream if just some of these players would be interested in taking part of that mini game. So the game designers did a really good job building this into the game where they're flying with their spaceships so the uh, players could find a foreign cell sample that they were supposed to analyze and if they did that they got some reward in the game and the aim was that they would determine the subcellular localization and in the end there were more than 300 thousand players that participated in this, which led to 32 million classifications, which would be 70 working years of humans uh, if researchers would do this. So that is, of course, a lot of data to analyze. But in the end, that led to a really nice publication where comparison was also done with um, artificial intelligence. So this is a really interesting study that I recommend you to have a look at. And another way of involving the community outside the Human Protein Atlas is um, a Kaggle um, classification challenge that has done, been done together with nature methods. And there was one challenge in 2018-19 where more than 2,000 teams were participating and there's a new challenge launched now as well. And there's one paper published with the results from this first challenge. So to build models, how different cells can be analyzed in terms of subcellular localization and specific patterns. And I would just like to end with saying that in addition to the six different main sections of the Human Protein Atlas, we also have an interactive tissue and cell dictionary where you can zoom in on the entire screen and get markings of the different cell types that are present in the different human tissues. This is really helpful if you want to learn how to look at the tissues that we have in the human protein atlas and also the different subcellular structures in detail. And you can use uh, different fields and combine them to get your own specific advanced 
searches. And as I mentioned previously, we also have these interactive knowledge chapters from different sections. And there's several different downloadable data sets where you can download the entire data that we have on the Human Booking Atlas and use that in your own way. And thus you will also add a specific section for SARS-CoV-2 related proteins. So I would like to conclude that in the Human Protein Atlas, we have added comprehensive summaries of both transcriptomics and proteomics data into six different sections. And we have analyzed and integrated big data from multiple external sources as well. And this is still ongoing and we're continuing to adding new data and there's quite many exciting things planned for the October release as well with many new additions. So keep checking into the Human Protein Atlas, even if you're not using it now, maybe you will find something useful in the future. And uh, we believe that by understanding the spatial distribution of proteins that gives biological and functional information of the proteins. And hopefully this can in the future lead to biomarker discovery and progress in precision medicine to be used for the clinic and for the patients in the end. And with that, I would like to thank many people from the Human Protein Atlas project, the group leaders, several different collaborators, and especially my team in Uppsala. And I would like to end by showing one of these 3D video clips that I talked about that we have done with light shield microscopy. The pancreas produces enzymes to facilitate the digestion of food. It is also responsible for regulating blood sugar levels with insulin. A malfunction in insulin production leads to diabetes. In this 3D movie of the pancreas, insulin, shown in green, is stored in the pancreatic islets of Langerhans. In red, we see the nerve fibers forming a fine network dispersed throughout the whole pancreas, surrounding the blood vessels and the islets. The 3D image enables detailed investigation of the islets and nerves, their interaction and detailed locations within the space. Thank you very much. And all right. I... Thank you, Cecilia, for this very nice talk. Um, yeah, let's move to the Q and A. Um, we have a few questions already listed in the Q and A uh, box. Um, by all means, if you have others, um, ask away. Um, I might kick off with a more general one, if I may. Um, but. Okay, this, this, this um, human protein atlas is, is massive. There's a lot of information and there's, what was it? 71 million uh, classifications to be uh, validated still uh, from the gaming effort. Um, if you look throughout these 15 years, I guess there's a lot of references to this human protein atlas, but what has it been used for the most? If, if people go to this, repository? What do they actually use it for the most? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And we, of course, try to keep track on the traffic to the Human Protein Atlas and try to see what users are looking for. Mm -hmm. And what was a little bit surprising was that the clicks to the final images are, are still not that big. So we try to emphasize to please look at the images as well. Um, but it seems that most users are looking at certain genes and proteins. And when there's a trend in science and 
for example, PDL one in when that came up as an important protein in cancer, that has definitely been rising in the number of hits. And now ACE2 is the most clicked protein. And actually it was just three weeks into the pandemics passed by EGFR and the other top ones. Yeah. So you can see what the scientific community is, is working on. Working on, yes. Well, let's move to the ACE, ACE2 questions that we have in the, the Q&A session. Uh, the first one by Andreas Bikvalfi. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Did you look in ACE2 expression in, uh, I mean, you presented some data on lungs and other tissues, but you, did you also specifically look at, at blood vessels, large, small blood vessels, lymphatics, etc.? Yeah, we tried to look at blood vessels in every organ where we could see them. We could not find any expression in the larger blood vessels, but in smaller ones in in some organs, maybe mainly the endocrine organs, actually. We could not determine at our resolution if it was endothelial cells or parasites. So we would like to look into that further, maybe with confocal microscopy. Yep. Okay. And maybe to follow up as well, uh, Charlotte Stadler also had a question on this. Okay. Regarding ACE expression, uh, appears to be very low in lung and many other organs. Does this implicate that ACE2 is not the major receptor used by the virus to infect cells? Hard question to answer, but... Yeah, th that's a good question. I think it has definitely been proven by many other methods that ACE2 plays a major role mm. um, and that we know, but maybe there could be co-receptors still and there could be more proteins involved. And there are several pub papers where they suggest other receptors. So I think there's still a lot more to learn, or it could be that the expression of ACE2 is upregulated mm -hmm. in infection, that something happens then, or there could be a difference between individuals and, or the expression in nasal epithelia is maybe more important than the expression in lung. And mm -hmm. the virus finds these few cells. It, yes. it could still be possible. I also have uh, a few questions from other channels as well. Um, more practical one, maybe. Is it possible to download uh, in a FASTA format or something else uh, tissue specific databases, or is that not possible? Yes, so uh, I'm not sure I completely understood the question, but it is possible to download, for example, uh, all genes that are expressed in a certain organ uh, and are uh, elevated in that organ compared to that, yeah, that's, other organs. That's indeed the question. Can you create a tissue specific search database, something like that, uh, I guess? Yeah, so any type of combination you do yourself in the search string, and there are many different options of filters, mm -hmm. the end result that you get, you can download um as it is all right and then maybe a few other questions that i got uh, that point to additions to um the human protein atlas i guess you already have a, a full list of, of things you want to work on but maybe some other hints here um would it be worthwhile to include a multi imaging or loppet data um for orthonogal confirmation or not? Is that something you guys are thinking about or not? That's a really good point. And of course, mass spectrometry is an orthogonal method. And that's even at the protein level then. Mm -hmm. So we have several discussions with other groups that are working with both mass spectrometry imaging and other types of mass spectrometry to see how we can perform such studies to see how those results could be compared. Mm -hmm. So far, we have not done a large scale project and if that would be feasible in a way that it could be added to the human protein atlas, I'm not sure at this stage, but it, yep. it is definitely thought to be a research project we want to look into. Okay. Very good. Well, you have the tissue atlas right now, you have the single cell type atlas, you have pathology atlas as well, and then focused on brain and blood as well. 
Another question that, that, that arrived here is, what about, it's completely different, of course, what about a PTM atlas? Tissue specific yes. or something? <laughs> is this something? And there is even more to look or? at, yeah. It's not something we have uh, prioritized right now because we are still focusing mainly on antibody-based proteomics and the information you can retrieve from that. Mm -hmm. but that could maybe also be something that could be discussed as a research project first in collaboration mm -hmm. with someone working on that and see how that could be integrated uh, let's move to the Q&A maybe again uh, very exciting talk a comment by Amy Kimoto thanks for sharing your work I'm interested in if you are planning to work on disease tissue atlas as for example NFDLG NASH, cancer, et cetera. I think some of that is already included, right? Yes, in the current pathology atlas, we're only looking at cancer right now. Uh, but there is, of course, a possibility to add metabolic diseases and other types of diseases as well. Um, and we would then probably focus on particular sets of genes and not at the protein level, level restain all the 15,000 proteins again, but maybe use mRNA as a selection of targets and mm -hmm. protein analysis on specific targets. All right. What do we have more? Um, yeah, there's a comment on the citizen science concept, the gaming uh, initiative. Um, yeah, he lost the initiative, Sampurna Chatterji. I'm just wondering, I mean, you have all these classifications now. Um, how do you validate all of these? Is this just confirmed with the, your deep learning algorithms or do you really manually validate a subset or how, how do you go about this? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So for the, for the cell atlas, they are working a lot with machine learning. Uh, which they started together with the citizen science project to also compare scoring done by the gamers and the researchers and machine learning and several efforts that have followed after that. For the tissue-based data, it's a little bit more challenged because there are so many different tissue types and the data is a little bit less quantitative with the DAB staining. Mm -hmm. and many different cell types within the same image. But we have some scientific collaborations in that field and artificial intelligence is really growing and digital pathology. So I do think that is the future to try to see how we can integrate that with the, all the images that we have on the tissues, both in normal and cancer, because currently all that scoring has been done manually. Yep. And it's done by one person and then confirmed by second experts. We have a quality control, but of course it's still the human eye. Yes, definitely. I think machine learning algorithms can help out a lot there, I guess. Right? Yeah. To, to, to scan all of this information much more quickly. Um, right, um, next one in line. I did not see clarity or cubic images. I don't know what this is, but maybe you do. <laughs> Do you plan to do this or include this? Andreas Bikvalfi also asks. Yeah, I'm also not sure I completely understand, but I think clarity is when you, yeah, a little bit what we have been doing in these 3D movies, mm -hmm. we have, so that you can look into um, stain specific structures more in 3D. So we have done that with these movies. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's very, very time consuming and takes weeks just for one of those stainings. But, so it's not something we have planned to do for all the human proteins, but it's, it's very interesting in particular cases, if I understood the question correctly. Yeah. yeah. Um, another question was on any plans in deeper classification of immune cells, so specific immune cells or not? Yeah, I'm reading the question at the same time here. 
So we can currently just distinguish these immune subset of immune cells that we have, these 18 different types of immune cells. Um, so that's the current resolution that we have. But of course, that could maybe be something for the future. I guess this always starts with a collaboration with a group that's really specialized in that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Um, I had another question. Um, right now, there's a lot of RNA sequencing uh, integrated in the human protein atlas, right? Um, of course, new sequencing approaches always appear. Uh, you have the third generation sequencing that actually could help out in, in isoform detection or classification. Is there any uh, effort in going towards including newer types of sequencing approaches or not really right now? Uh, we have been looking into ourselves also if we want to do single cell RNA sequencing and, and complement that from a body-wide perspective so that we could maybe add for the entire human body and things mm -hmm. like that. But at the same time, there are so many different efforts done in the entire world with people being experts on new methods that are being developed. So we have also decided to, to also see what happens, which types of data that can be integrated with our data. Mm -hmm. So we have no current plans to expand some transcriptomic efforts internally, but I'm sure there will be many new data sets that we can compare with in the future. It's definitely a growing field. I guess there's no um, really lack of data, right? To yeah, <laughs> exactly. I think it's the, the effort that it, it takes to actually integrate all of this information that is more uh, limiting. Um, a question by ja Karin Yu. Thank you for your talk. A general question regarding the human protein atlas. So the tissues that are used are not from healthy individuals. Apparently this is answered in the frequently asked questions page. How can you be sure some proteins are not overly or underexpressed, although the tissue is histo histologically normal as they are from patient samples? And how many different individuals have been included in the database? This is a very important point, of course, and it's because of tissue access, because it, it would not be possible to do the project from completely healthy individuals and get that type of tissues from the entire human body. So currently just the heart and brain are post-mortem, but most of the other samples are samples that ended up in the biobank for a reason. And that would in most cases be because someone has surgery for a cancer and they take out a larger piece and close to the cancer, there is some tissue classified as normal that we could use as normal. We would always have a look at it ourselves again to confirm that it looks completely normal. And any image we come across when we do the staining that doesn't look normal, we would try to remove. And we always stain three individuals for each normal tissue. And I must say that it is quite rare that we do see a difference in the staining pattern between those three in the normal tissues. So that it, is also a confirmation because they would have different diagnoses and completely different individuals and age and gender. So if there's basically no difference, that could tell that it's probably not affected by the nearby cancer. But of course we cannot be completely sure. So if something should be really studied in detail, you would need a larger mm -hmm. sample collection. All right, thank you. Uh, another one by Maria. Thanks for the great talk. I was wondering if you have a plan to include more clinical information in the pathology atlas, like the grade of tumor progression or the subtype. There is such information for some of the cancers. So that is based on the information that TCGA has. Yep. Um, and I know if, if there are subtypes, uh, adenocarcinomas or squamous cell carcinomas for the same cancer type that should be possible to see under that cancer type. But we do know that some of the information is limited and a lot of the TCA data 
also have limited follow-up due to the medical records of the samples that they have been using. If someone moved to another state in the US, I think they lost that information. So the survival data is a little bit fragmented uh, and therefore we are planning to collect our own data sets there actually, because we have many such ongoing projects in Sweden to complement that for at least some of the cancer types, maybe with novel information that could then also have more clinical information connected to it. All right. Uh, maybe one last question then, or the second but last because a new one came up. Uh, a question by Petra van Damme, when localization or contrasting, what apparently has been reported in literature, do you think this is largely due to errors reported or rather the cell dependency? Uh, meaning in case of three cell lines tested, which is mostly done, I guess, are these results in most cases always consistent if expression is evidenced or not? So it's really contrasting localization question. Yeah, the challenge here is to determine what is literature and what is valid literature. And if you search a protein at PubMed, you can find many uh, publications. And Uniprot has then done an effort to, to summarize what is considered to be um, the concluded data but still that is also an interpretation and just based on the publications that are existing, which could be based on other methods. So for each protein, we need to determine if we think that the staining that we see is correct by collecting all types of information that we can find. And Uniprot is an important source for that. Um, but by testing three different cell lines, one could then uh, I guess this person then means localization in the subcellular localization. Yeah. By testing three different cell lines, one could then see if this, this subcellular localization matches between the three cell lines. But it is then, of course, also important to think of high, how high the protein level is in these three particular cell lines, and maybe it's really low in one of them. So we, we need to manually validate each yeah. okay. case, <laughs> spend so a lot, a lot of, of time on that. Manual validation is still necessary. Um, and then the last one by Tina Klaas. Um, thank you for your interesting talk. I was wondering why the Human Protein Atlas only uses three transcriptomics data sets. Only three, that's true, but these are very large transcriptomics data sets. And I think you also included single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, of course, there's much more available, right, publicly. Um, but I guess this is about integration efforts, right, or not? Yeah, as far as I know, these are the three biggest ones that have data from many different organs. Indeed. So yeah. otherwise, we would have to cherry pick data from some organs and then integrate all of them. And I can definitely say that the normalization step between those three was a very, very big bioinformatic challenge. And we are planning to change it again for the October release actually, because we do think that the normalization can be better. Um, so by integrating too many that just have data for some sources, for some organs, and then how to weight that would be the even bigger challenge. But the GTEx data set is the biggest one because they have from 8,000 individuals and sometimes hundreds of individuals for each patient. But this, this is also another example of a growing field. I think both bioinformatically, how to merge data sets, uh, will, these methods will improve and there will be more and more data sets added. So yes, I'm sure there will be more changes from the human protein of us. That in the future as well. Although it's only three transcriptomics data sets, it holds already a lot of information again. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, with this, I would like to thank you, especially you, Cecilia, uh, to present your work uh, on the Human Protein Atlas here. 
I would also like to thank uh, the KVCV uh, to give us the opportunity to give this online uh, session uh, with their infrastructure. And of course, I would like to thank the audience for listening. Um, normally, we would all, all have uh, big hands for uh, <laughs> Dr. Cecilia, but this is uh, rather impossible right now. So uh, again, thanks a lot, everybody, especially uh, Dr. Cecilia Linskoch. And uh, I hope to see you all next time in our next session. And enjoy the evening, everybody. Bye-bye.